Father, we come before you and we thank you for your word. And we ask as we open your Bible, once again, Lord, we are living in times that many longed to see and we're watching them unfold. God, I pray that you would stir our hearts. There would be that sense of expectation. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, but it's also beginning to look a lot like time for Jesus. And isn't that awesome? Lord, stir our hearts that our joy might be full. The day of our redemption is drawing near. How soon, I don't know, Lord, but I pray that we would be living expectantly. Be with us now and open your word to every heart that is listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, Titus, that the aged men be sober, temperate, sound in faith, charity, patience, that the aged women likewise, that they be in behaviors, becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste. By the way, my kids asked my wife, so did dad ask you for a list? <laughs> and she said, no. But I will preface, she wouldn't wait for a list. <laughs> and we talk a lot. I would be served notice if I was out of order long before a list. And, uh, and that's one of the things I love about her. So we keep pretty short accounts because you never know if you have tomorrow. And uh, I'm grateful for that. So I said, no, we don't keep a list. We talk all the time. But anyway, unfortunately, I did ask her, do you have a list? She said, no, I would have told you before. <laughs> Wait for a list. So I'm just letting you know. By the way, when you teach the premarital class once a year, which I do, guess what you get to examine once a year? Your own marriage. Exactly. To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. So verse 9 we pick up. Exhort servants, oh my, to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things. Not answering again, the idea is incessantly objecting to what is said to them or in a sense doing their own thing instead of following the orders that are given to them. Not answering again. If you have kids, you understand that idea. I told you to do this and they want to argue. Not purloining or stealing is the idea, which by the way, Onesimus will be noted for and you will know all about Onesimus as we get into Philemon or Philemon, depending on how you read them. Not purloining, but showing good fidelity, <clears throat> all good fidelity, honesty, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. Okay, number one, the Bible addresses and deals with slavery as an ongoing institution. If you go back and you read, for example, in Genesis chapter 4, there you will find among the line that comes from Cain a number of things, including the first you know, uh, polygamous marriage. And there's a man named Lamech, not the Lamech and Noah's line in Genesis 6, but Lamech that you'll find there in Genesis 4 from the line of Cain, he has two wives, Ada and Zillah. So already within one or two chapters where God created one man for one woman for life, you find the ungodly have already moved into polygamy. Okay, so it starts among the ungodly as we look at chapter 4. Other things also began among them. And somewhere early in the history of man, as soon as they could figure out they could get away with it, you can bet slavery started. I'm guessing it was there before the flood. Why? Well, I see polygamy, I see murder, I see everything else. So I'm willing to bet it was there before the flood. And of course, you know, started up after the flood. Interesting, if you read the book of Exodus, in chapter 19, there God with a trumpet gathers the nation there to the foot of uh, what is uh, Mount Sinai, not Mount Sinai, to the foot of Mount Sinai or what we call Mount Sinai, Jebel al is there over in Midian. He gets them to the foot of the mountain. They put the barrier around it. The trumpet gets louder and louder and louder. You're like, enough, we got it. <clears throat> and then the Lord says, he begins to speak from that mountain burning with fire. And he begins to speak Exodus chapter 20, where he gives them the how many? Ten commandments. 
And he continues to give some instruction. And the people say, Moses, we can't take this any longer. We can't hear the voice of God anymore lest we die. Let's make a deal. You go talk to him. When you come back, we'll do everything he says. Sure they did. Fine. So we get through that. And then Exodus 21. We've done the Ten Commandments. We've realized the people, this is too intense for them to take. They're getting further and further away from that mountain, burning with fire, kind of just, you know, getting their way out of there. And the next thing God talks to him about after the Ten Commandments in Exodus 21 is regulating slavery. Okay, so that for me is interesting. You see the heart of God. He deals, he calls the people, gives them the Ten Commandments. Okay, here's a basic code of which will be 613 total. Here are the basics. And the next thing he wants to talk about is regulating and dealing with slavery. I think that shows his heart. By the way, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, left turn. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Remember, when Paul would write to the Corinthians, there was already a very thriving and ongoing slave trade within the Roman Empire. The city of Rome, population 2 million, 1 million of which are slaves. Slaves throughout the empire was an existing, ongoing practice that happened again, much throughout the world. And God again gives his heart on this. Interesting as he says to them, verse 7, chapter 7, 1 Corinthians, as God has distributed to every man... So that every man, the Lord has called everyone, so let him walk, so I ordain in all churches. Is anyone called being circumcised? Well, then let him, let him not become uncircumcised. And yeah, apparently they could do that somehow. Is anyone called in uncircumcision? Well, then let him not be circumcised. In other words, don't bother changing. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. Verse 20, let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called, except here. Are you called being a servant or a slave? Care not for it. Don't let it make you upset or be concerned. But if thou may be made free, go for it. Isn't that interesting? That's the place he says, yeah, you should change it. If you're called being a slave, don't be concerned. But if you can be set free, use it rather. Go for it. For he that is called in the Lord being a servant is the Lord's free man. Interesting word only used here in the New Testament is the Lord's emancipated slave. Because in heaven you will be free. Likewise also he that is called being free, we have become Christ's servants voluntarily. You are bought with a price that gives him lordship. Be not the servants of men. Very clear. If you can be made free, you should go for it. You were bought with a price. If you can be made free, be free. But obviously these things won't be fixed until obviously the Lord returns. Is there still slavery in the world? Yes, Absolutely. Even here in the United States, what kind of trade is it? The sex trade. People are brought in and abducted and everything else. Slavery goes on around the world in the classic sense as well as in the, you know, the criminal element sense here in the United States. So he goes back to our chapter. Exhort servants. If you're a believer and you are a slave, you are exhorted to be obedient to your own masters, to be in rank underneath, again, hupotasso, to serve them well. You see, because... As a believer who happens to be a slave, if you serve them well, you might actually reach your master for Christ and they become a believer. Interesting, as the gospel message began to spread, slavery would eventually be eradicated. And yes, I understand what happened in the United States. And yes, I understand there were people who claimed to be God's people who tried to use scripture to justify slavery. There are lots of people who take scripture and try to justify all kinds of things with it. But the fact is, give it time. The people who know their God realize this needs to go. And give it time, and God does indeed do those things throughout England, throughout the United States, and elsewhere. Exert servants to be obedient to their own masters, to please them well in all things, not answering again. And of course, we could take this to employee-employer relationship today. No stealing. Showing all good fidelity. So that even though you may be a servant, you may adorn the doctrine of God. You may look, make the doctrine of salvation look good. Ever since my servant came to know Jesus, he's become one of the most faithful people I've had working for me. Really? Well, what was the change? He said he met Jesus. In other words, you can use your position wherever God happens to have found you, no matter what your circumstances may be, to live a changed life that honors God and reach the people around you where he's put you, no matter what kind of circumstance you're in. I can give you many stories of missionaries who were put in, Chinese national missionaries and others, put in prison for their faith, which ended up leading many prison guards and fellow prisoners to Christ just because they were incarcerated. I've seen that happen with missionaries in Mexico, China, and other countries as well, Russia, et cetera, et cetera. 
So even if you're in difficult circumstances, honor God and God will use it. That you may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Verse 10, interesting. God our Savior. We heard that in verse 3, chapter 1. According to the commandment of God our Savior. We saw verse 4. From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. God, our Savior. Interesting. We have it now again, God, our Savior. We'll have it again in verse 13 of chapter 2. God, our Savior. He's God, our Savior. Well, you're going to have to prove that. Fine. Left turn, Isaiah. Left turn, Isaiah. 35. You've been going here a lot. Yep. Good one to memorize. Isaiah 35, which, by the way, Wednesday nights, if you're wondering, what do they do on Wednesday night? Well, we sit here and we go verse by verse. Well, that's what we do on Sunday. Exactly. But we're in Isaiah. Chapter 35, verse 3, strengthen ye the weak hands, confirm the feeble knees, say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He, that is your God, will come with and save you. And when your God comes and saves you, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, whose ministry did this? Jesus. Then shall the lame man leap as the deer, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. Interesting. Turn now to Isaiah 42, a couple of pages to the right. So your God will come and save you, and when your God comes to save you, the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf the lame will walk. Isaiah 42, verse 1. Behold, my servant, who we learn is one and the same with your God who comes to serve you, to save you. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. See if this rings any bells. A bruised reed shall he not break. A smoking flax shall he not quench. Who was that mentioned of? Jesus. Matthew 12. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he has set judgment in the earth and the isle shall wait for his law. Thus saith the God, the Lord, he that created the heavens and that stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, uh, he that giveth bread unto the people upon it, and the spirit to them that walk therein. I have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and will give you for a covenant. How about a new covenant in his blood? Will give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. How many of you are Gentiles in this room? Okay, other hand, how many of you believe in Jesus and you're a Gentile? You just filled that verse. To open, look at this. When the servant of verse 1 comes, who will be a light to the Gentiles, who brings a covenant, verse 7, you'll know it's him because once again he'll open the blind eyes to bring out the prisoners from prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison. I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare before they spring forth, I will tell you of them. Interesting. Look also at Isaiah now 48. So your God is going to come save you. The Lord is going to send forth his servant who also does the same things, opening the eyes of the blind. Isaiah 48 verse 12, he says, hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my call. I am he. I am the first. I am also the last. My hand also has laid the foundation of the earth. My right hand has spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. God is speaking. Look at verse six. Come ye near unto me and hear thee this. I have not spoken in secret. From the beginning, from the time that it was, there am I. And now the Lord God, that is the Father, and his Spirit, there is the Holy Spirit, have sent God himself, who will be a servant, who opens the eyes of the blind. Me, he says. Go to Isaiah 52 on your way back. Isaiah 52. Isaiah continuing to see more of this suffering servant of the Lord, who is God himself. He says in verse 13, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Many will be astonished at you. His visage, his appearance will be so marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations with his own blood. 
Kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see. That which they had not heard shall they consider. Who has believed a report? Isaiah is almost incredulous. Does anybody else see this? To whom is the arm of the strength of the Lord revealed? For him, the servant of Jehovah, who is God himself, shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. When we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. But he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, your God will come and save you. He will be a servant. He will open the eyes of the blind. Surely he has borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. We thought he was being judged for blasphemy. Remember the high priest. I adjure you by God. You're under oath. Tell us whether or not you be the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, I am. Very important phrase. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Father of the power. And the high priest ripped his garments and he said he spoke blasphemy. No, he gave testimony because your God will come and save you. They thought he was getting it for blasphemy. He was actually telling the truth and it was God himself redeeming us from sin. Isaiah points this out. We thought he was smitten and afflicted of God. Verse 5, but the real story is he was wounded for our transgressions. Your God will come and save you. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He came to save us. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before his shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off, executed. Out of the land of the living. Why? For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Your God will come and save you. He made his grave with the wicked, two thieves on crosses. And with the rich in his death, Joseph of Arimathea. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, your God will come and save you. He shall see his followers, those who are his seed is the idea. He shall prolong his days, he'll live again. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. And by his knowledge, or by the knowledge of him, shall my righteous servant, who opens the eyes of the blind, justify many. Why? For he will bear their iniquities. Nice. God, our Savior. It's all through Isaiah. God, our Savior. So, not purloining, back to Titus 2, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. So, verse 11. For the grace of God, the grace of God. What's grace? Well, you're going to tell us a thing about the policeman pulling you over and Mercy and grace and all that. Grace is not, not, mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you absolutely don't deserve. Favor. The grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Now remember, when Titus is writing these things, or sorry, when Paul is writing these things to Titus, Titus has traveled with him from city to city, and he's heard them teach these things repeatedly. So he can just say, the grace of God has appeared to all men. And Titus would know, yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it, the grace of God. But for us, let's look at a verse, Ephesians 2. The grace of God, Ephesians chapter 2. Just a reminder. What time of the year is it? Christmas. Who are you, Lord? Lord? I think it's Christmas. Is that a trick question? Christmas. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, dead spiritually, hath quickened us together with Christ. You see, by grace are you saved has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace, how? 
and his kindness towards us. In what way? Through Christ Jesus. You see, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, the very faith and all these things we exercise were gift. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Question. Someone wants to give you a gift. You can receive it, or you can reject it. Is that clear? So God's grace is a gift. You don't buy it. You don't earn it. People say, well, I want to come to Jesus, but I, I got to clean up my life first. Doesn't work that way. Here's a gift. If you will receive that gift in your heart by faith, God will give you the living water and you'll change. You see, step one, be born into the kingdom by faith. Step two, the king will begin to change you from the inside out. People get that backwards. Well, I got to clean up my life first. You can't. You have no power. But when you open your heart to the Lord and you receive him as your savior, and it is a simple transaction of faith, it's not by works, is what he said, for by grace through faith you've been saved, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. You don't earn it. You can't improve on the deal. You receive it. Now that you received it, what have you done with it? Have you changed how you live at home? Have you changed how you live among the people that are in your life? Can they see that something has happened in your life? That's not what saved you, the byproduct of salvation. What saved you is the day you believed upon Jesus and you asked him to forgive you for your sins. And you said, Lord, I believe you paid for me 2,000 years ago on that cross. I believe I have a sin problem that your father has to judge. I believe you've taken my place and I ask your forgiveness. The day that you asked him to forgive you and into your heart as your savior, that was the day you were saved from your sins. Now, from that point, hopefully your life begins to change. But the change is simply a byproduct of the fact that God's spirit has come into you. Salvation is a gift. You receive it. That's it. Having received it, you should change. Once God fills your heart, things should change. But it's him first. It's by grace through faith you've been saved. That not of yourselves. It was a gift of God. All you got to say is, yes, I'll take it. And he'll start working. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That's what comes after you meet Jesus. Which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So back to our chapter. The grace of God that brings salvation. You just receive him. He'll change you from the inside out. That brings salvation hath appeared unto all men. Now people look at that and say, but there are closed countries. Well, what we've been hearing repeatedly, especially in the Islamic world, is many, many people having visions, as Joel prophesied in the last days, dreams and visions of the Lord or others appearing to them and telling them they need to know Christ. We've heard that now for probably the last 12 to 15 years, and, uh, and it has not slowed down. Places that are closed, people are getting saved. Isn't that amazing? Well, then we don't have to evangelize. No. But where we're locked out, God's still working. But it's interesting, too, the grace of God has appeared to all men, Let's let God tell us. Look at Romans 1 for a minute. Well, how can God judge the world when there are people who haven't... Well, hold on, slow down. Look at Romans 1. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven, and it will come, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Why? Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. What truth? Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Now, we have an advantage from Paul. We now can look at molecules and atoms and subatomic things. We now know that cells are not simple. We now know there's DNA. The more we study DNA, we learn it actually wraps and changes shape depending on what functions it needs to access. We have learned by what was to them invisible, we have seen the extreme detail, wisdom, and design in what God has made. So our generation is with less excuse than theirs. Here he was saying, look, by the invisible things of him from the creation of the world, it's clearly seen by the things that are made, you can tell there are things you can't see that God did behind the scenes. Now we're beginning to get peeks at them. 
So he says that there's a knowledge of God that is given to every man simply by what God has made. The creation of the world clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power to do this, and his Godhead, his order, his structure, his design, so that they, the whole world, are without excuse by what he's made. What does it say? The heavens declare glory of God. Because that when they knew God, here's the indictment, they knew God, but they decided to suppress the truth, is what it says to us. They held the truth down. They suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. They stuffed it. When they knew God, God says everyone has a knowledge. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but they became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. The idea is literally became stupid. How? They changed the glory of the incorruptible God made into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds, to four-footed beasts, to creeping things. And so God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Those who changed the truth of God, which was clearly shown to them, into a lie. And look at this. They began to worship and serve the creation, the creature, the creation, more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Not only that, look at Romans 2, verse 14. When the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these Gentiles, not having the law of Moses, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. How? Their conscience. So not only is there a witness to every one of the things that have been made that there's a God, but then God put into your body what we call firmware. Firmware is a type of operating system that stays permanently with the device, even in the junkyard. Firmware. And what he gave you was a conscience. And when you were a kid, you used to listen more to your conscience. Like, you know, when you took that golf club of your father's to things in the garage. And there was something in you saying, don't do that. Or when you're out back, you know, clipping down the flower heads off your mother's flowers, there was something in your heart saying, don't do that. And when you were, you know, grandma wasn't looking and you were, you know, there was that little sense in your heart. That was your conscience. It was God-given. Firmware. So not only is there a witness of God in his creation one day, and I'm curious, I wonder if God interrogates our conscience when you stand before him. Because the conscience does one of two things. It bears witness. The thoughts, the meanwhile, that shows the work of the law, verse 15, written on their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. The thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. And the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So Titus had heard this repeatedly. The grace of God has appeared to all men, but they've made decisions. They've chosen to reject. So back to Titus. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. God will leave them without excuse. That judgment will be fair. And the grace of God is teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, having met him, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world. By the way, notice, no longer are we talking to men, women, old men, young women, older women, young men, whatever. Now we're talking to everybody. We should live as God's people, soberly, righteously, self-restrained, righteously and godly in this present world, which we're learning more and more on the news has no restraint, does it? So we're looking for that blessed hope. We're looking for that blessed hope. What's our hope? Lower taxes? A couple are like, Jesus, come on, what's wrong with you people? People, people. Jesus. Let me show it to you, John 14. What was the hope the disciples were holding on to? John 14. Things are bad in the upper room. Things are at an all-time low. And Jesus said this to them, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, Jesus said, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to welcome like a guest, to receive you unto myself. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, where is he? The Father's house. Where I am, you may be also. In other words, 
Let not your heart be troubled. I'm going home to prepare a place for you. And when it's ready, I'm going to come and you get to come over to my father's house. That's our blessed hope. So the question comes up. We'll show you. Just because if I don't do it this week, I'll get, it. I'll get complaints. You didn't show us the chart. Okay, fine. By the way, I don't normally have such a not normally large cursor, but for sake of everybody being able to see. Okay, Ezekiel 36. Israel re will rebloom, fruits, flowers, the hills will have trees. 57 million trees planted in Israel since the beginning of the 1900s. These things fulfilled. Ezekiel 37. Like dried bones, Jews coming from all over the world, especially with the collapse of the Soviet Union. This, if it's not completely fulfilled, is near the very end. What am I? I'm on that one. I'm on that one. The presenter screen is, we added a TV. We'll find Dan Cregan watching Eagles in here, but that's okay. That one's working. Aha. We're out of time. Just <laughs> Ezekiel 36, here you go. Land's reblooming. Ezekiel 37, Jews coming from all over the world. Isaiah 17, Damascus, one of the oldest continually inhabited cities, will suddenly be destroyed. Benjamin Netanyahu has warned Bashar al-Assad that if they continue to do incursions from Syria into Israel, or if they allow the Iranians to do incursions from Syria into Israel, that they will bomb his palace in Damascus. That's in the news. And we're talking serious loss of life. This isn't great. But this is unfulfilled and could be on the edge of happening. When that happens, it is my guess that that is going to bring the response of Russia, Libya, Iran, Persia, Libya, Turkey, Ethiopia, Sudan, Ethiopia, Egypt, depending on what tribal region. These guys are going to respond. Okay? Where are we? These are done. This is pending. It could happen within a year. You never know with what's going on in the Syrian war and Iran moving next door to Israel and all the warnings going back and forth. That may trigger this event which might give rise to then a peace agreement by an antichrist. So where are we? Well, I think we can honestly say we're somewhere around here. Yeah, but you got a couple different errors for the rapture. You're right. We'll talk about it next week. We're out of time. Let's stand. Let's pray. Well, at least I showed you the chart. You can't get upset. Father, we come before you and we are looking for that blessed hope. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us as a church. Lord, thank you. The gift of salvation is free. Now, what will we do with it? Will we take that wonderful gift, that talent, bury the truth because we're afraid? Or will we start, Lord, telling people alongside of us at work and home and neighborhoods and travel teams and bridge groups or wherever we may be, Lord, that we have a sense of expectation. The news is prophetic at this point the things that are happening. God, help us to be ready. And Lord, help us to be living in such a way that no matter when you come, we are not caught by surprise, but we're ready to hear the master's voice and to open to him. Thank you for these things, Lord. Strengthen your church as they go this week. And thank you for your love and your mercy that is new every morning to all who would seek your face. And I do pray for anyone that doesn't know you. You open your heart. He will come in. You call upon the name of the Lord. You believe he paid for you. You will be saved. Watch and see. Open your heart and watch your life change as you invite Jesus in. Thank you for these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.